Good morning, friends. Um, I'm going to be reading um, a, a section Good morning, friends. Thanks for coming back to hear another story. Today I'm reading part of a book called Lincoln and His Boys by Rosemary Wells. Abraham Lincoln was one of the presidents of the United States. You may have heard of him and you may not, but if you haven't, you soon will. He was a very important man in the history of the United States. And this is the story of him and some of his children. Um, it starts off because we just will learn about one. We're just going to read about one of his sons named Willie. And that's where the book starts. Lincoln and his boys. Chapter one, Willie. Every evening, my brother Tad and I run over to father's office on the corner of Adams Street. We huck handfuls of pebbles up at the window panes so father knows we're coming. Tad is smaller than I am, but he can throw the pebbles harder and make more noise. Mr. Herndon, father's law partner, likes things neat and quiet. He says we act like little wild orangutans, which is true but father doesn't ever scold us for what we do. If Mr. Herndon gets that look on his face and shakes his finger at us, father laughs. Tad makes most of the trouble. I never score ink or ruin briefs. Mostly I stack the big old law books and make pyramids out of them and then knock them all down. It's our job, says mama, to pull father out of his office and get him home for supper on time. So that's what we do after the sun goes down. On the walk home to our house on Jackson and 8th, Father and Tad and I always stop and talk to neighbors and dogs, and that makes us late. Then we run into the house and Father puts his arms around Mama and waltzes her around the room until she smiles and come out of her fretfulness about our being late for supper. When we sit at table, Mama makes dead sure we have good manners. We are not allowed resting on the elbows. Sometimes she chides father for wearing shirt sleeves around the house and not putting on his coat. He puts on his coat to make her happy. Then he puts his hand over his smile and declares the coat has just taken flight like an eagle and come to rest on the back of his chair. Here's a picture of Mr. Abraham Lincoln dancing with his wife, Mary, and two of the boys. We chew with mouths closed and don't slurp our soup. Tad has trouble eating. He was born with a hole in the roof of his mouth and has to have all his food cut up for him. His manners are not as good as mine, but they are on the way up. Tonight at supper, when Tad pulled my hair, Mama said, Taddy, darling, who knows where we'll be a year from now? It might be in the finest palaces of Paris, France. They don't let little boys with no table manners eat in the dining rooms in the palaces. Immediately, I wonder why Mama says this about palaces in France. It might could mean she is planning, planning an escape from Springfield, Illinois to a fancier place. Long ago, father was a congressman in Washington. Does this mean father is readying up for another election? Taddy and I discuss it in bed. Mama ordered a new black suit for Papa Day, says Taddy from his pillow. She sent money in the letter. Two pairs of trousers. How do you know, I ask. She told me, Taddy answers. She let me mail the letter to Mr. Steinway, the tailor in Chicago. That's how. I said to Mama, what's this letter for, Mama? 
and she tried to get me to read the address, but I couldn't. But then she said, it's to Mr. Steinway's tailor shop on Dearborn Avenue in Chicago. It's for a new suit. What do you think the new suit means? Tad, I asked. Tad didn't hesitate. Papa Day's going to turn around and re-whoop Mr. Douglas. Taddy always says Papa Day. It's way, it's his way of saying Papa Dear. Taddy's cleft palate makes him lots of, gives him lots of lispy speech trouble. Sometimes I have to translate what he says to people outside the family. A lot of people think Taddy is slow, but he doesn't miss a thing. He's as smart as a snake. When the time is right, I'll ask father if indeed he is working up to another scrap with Mr. Douglas. Mr. Douglas beat father in the Senate election in 1858. We did not like that one bit since Mr. Douglas told lies about father during their debates. It is decided that I, Willie, have good enough manners that I may visit Chicago with father when he goes to the courthouse there in early June. I am more excited than I have ever been in my entire nine years on earth. On June 2nd, the morning of our trip, mama parts my hair with her ivory comb. She slick, slicks it down both sides with water. It stays in place until the station. Then she kisses the top of my head when the train comes down the tracks. I let go her hand and change it for father's. Her hand is no bigger than a plump little sparrow. His hand is hard and brown and the span of my whole arm. Father scoops up my small bag and his large one. A strand of mama's black hair has come loose. It blows in her face until she tucks it back into its bun. She waves to us until I know it hurts her arm. Her eyes are shaded with her other hand. As she and she is squinting under the sun until she can't see us or the train anymore. Now I have father all to myself. This is superior train, Pa, I tell him proudly, because it is my first train. Father says that it's pretty tinky railway compared to others in Pennsylvania and New York. It takes all of a day to get to Chicago. Father and I walk to the Tre Tremont Hotel. I never did imagine so many people or so much noise all in one place. Willie, you look like the preacher on his first day in heaven, father says to me, surprised to see that so many other people got there too. People say about father that he's pine tall. This is due to his double long legs. In the way that tall people do, father tips sideways to hold my hand. In the Tremont Hotel lobby, is a whole forest of trees set in porcelain tubs. I ask what their strange long leaves are. Father says they are palms. The palm has a frond, not a leaf, he explains. F-R-O-N-D, frond. I spell it back to him and he is pleased. Then there is strange music. It's not a fiddle, it's not a piano or a horn. What is that, Pa? What is that little popping music, I ask him. It's a harp, says Father. So I say, that lady playing it must be an angel, because only angels play harps. Father agrees that she must be an angel. He tells me, close your mouth, son, and don't forget to blink your eyes once in a while. Suddenly, a whole bunch of men come up and talk to Father. A year ago, when he was running against Mr. Douglas, these same sort of men were always circling father and doing the same important sounding talk. Father loves to talk back. It's because he is a lawyer. And mama says lawyers are paid a dollar a minute to chatter away like monkeys in the trees. One of the men comes over and claps me on the back. His shirt is moon white. His fingernails clean and shined up like a woman's. Yeah, I must be quiet and we'll wait till they stop talking. There's a picture. Whole bunch of people standing there looking at big old tall Mr. Lincoln. If spoken to, I must answer with a straight shooter look in my eyes, father tells me. That's the key to it. Look them spang in the eye and speak up. 
then they won't treat you like a little squirt, he says. I watch father talk to these spiffed up men with soft hands. He makes them listen and makes them laugh. He's easy with them. It's mama who taught him just how to be easy with rich men. Mama come, comes from Kentucky people who own a fine amount of land. They drink out of pure crystal glasses and ride fancy horses. Mama knows how to be rich like these men, and she's proud of it. We sit down to supper in the hotel dining room. It looks sheerly like the royal banquet hall in King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. Father says to me, I'm going to shoot the breeze with you, Will, about a very grown-up set of things. He picks a piece of bread out of the basket that the waiter brings us and takes a bite of it. I can talk to you, Scout, better than to your big brother. Bob Lincoln is my big brother. He is away in the East at a big school. He'd be at Harvard, but he failed his exams and has to try again. Father and Bob haven't been close friends like father and me. They get under each other's skin. I asked father, Pa, is it those fancy duded up men? Do they want you to run in another election? You are sharp as a new tack, Scout, he says. He opens his menu and orders for both of us to the waiter who writes it down on a pad. I cannot eat my bread because my mouth goes a little dry. They want you to leave home again and travel all over the place? Like you did when you were running against Mr. Douglas, I asked. I will have to travel even as far as New York and Massachusetts and Maine, son. That's a far piece. You must take care of your mama now that Bobby's not home. Taddy and me, we hate being home without you, Pa, I says. Mom is always fretful when you're not there. She treads back and forth in the bedroom and makes the floor squeak. I know it. That's not a thing, and there's not a thing I can do about it. Will you be a senator this time, Pa? I asked. President, son. President of the whole United States? I say. I didn't think I heard him right. He looks me square in the eye. He says, Will, it's a derby race, and I've got a plow horse's chance. But if somebody doesn't shake these southern blockheads in Washington by the ears, we'll be living in a different country next year. Slavery's going to split America the way an axe cuts an apple. All of the last year, Father and Mr. Douglas debated up and down the state of Illinois. Mr. Douglas was for slavery being allowed in every state. Father was against it. Mr. Douglas won the election, but father got to be famous all the way to Boston and New York for his speeches. He has ordered us oysters, roast quail, steak royale, and sherbet Jenny Lind. We eat every bite. Who is Jenny Lind, I want to know. She is the best lady singer in the world, says father. That's why they named an ice cream for her. Tomorrow night, we will go and hear her at McVicker's Theater. Father loves entertainments. When he was a boy, he had no entertainments ever. Brother Bob told Tad and me that when father was a boy, he lived in a pokey little shack in the middle of the forest. Father's own puppy was, was a some, I'm sorry. Father's own pappy was a sometime drunk, said Brother Bob. Mostly out of work. He beat father for reading too many books. Bob told me and Taddy in secret that father disliked his own pappy so much, he wouldn't so much as visit the old man on his deathbed or raise a tombstone over his grave. This is not entirely true, Mama said when she heard the story. Father tried to visit the year before, but his pappy stayed alive. However it is, we don't ever see any kin from the Lincoln side, only Mama's side. Mama's people, the Todds, they live in Lexington, and my uncle Ninian gives me the piece of mint out of his mint julep, and I suck the sugar off of it, and then I eat the lemon peel. That is all that I am able to read of this fabulous book called Lincoln and His Boys. It's a great story. I hope you will go and look it up at the library and finish reading about Abraham Lincoln, who right now they're talking about a whole lot. And one of the 
one of the two most famous presidents we have. We talk a lot about Abraham Lincoln and we talk a lot about George Washington. But this book about Abraham Lincoln, I hope you will want to read it yourself and learn all about what a fabulous president and what a, what a fine man he was. Thank you friends for coming and I hope to see you next time. Bye.